Hello and welcome to this online lecture for Keats House Museum, celebrating 200 years since the publication of the poem La Belle dans Saint Merci. I'm Anna Mercer and I'm a lecturer in English Literature at Cardiff University. La Belle dans Saint Merci is my favourite of Keats's works and one of his finest and best loved poems. This talk is presented as the third in a series with two other talks by Professor Kelvin Everest and Dr Tess Somerville. You can look out for future Keats 200 events by following the museum on social media. La Belle dans Saint Merci was written in that hugely productive year for John Keats, 1819. However, the poem actually celebrates 200 years of publication in 2020 published as it was for the first time in Lee Hunt's Indicator on 10th of May, 1820. La Belle dans Saint Merci is a ballad in which a knight tells of his meeting with a lady in the meads, a fairy's child with wild eyes. He goes with her to her elfin grot and then he awakes from a dream, abandoned and alone on the cold hillside. The poem has been read as autobiographical, considering Keats's agony over both his love for Fanny Bourne and agony over his poetic calling, uh, Fanny Bourne being Keats's fiancée, um, the engagement ring that he gave her is actually on display at Keats' house. And La Belle has also received significant critical attention as a rewriting of the romance tradition. A good summary of this can be found in Geoffrey Cox's edition of Keats, if you wish to know more. Today, I'm going to suggest some of the Keats's direct contemporaries that express a similar interest in their verses with a wandering, forlorn protagonist alongside a hypnotic and beguiling figure. I also want to keep in mind the poem's rich imagery, depicting a landscape that is at once enticing and also hostile. Keats's poetry often gestures towards the unknown as a source of solace. After all, this is the poet who proclaimed Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Lines, of course, from Ode on a Grecian Urn, also composed in 1819. Keats, in his famous meditation on negative capability, argued that a state of unknowing might be desirable. But Labelle reasserts another Keatsian fascination, I think, an interest in melancholy and what we might call pessimism, perhaps, as the speaker invites the reader to recognise the subtlety by which poetry can encourage our affinity with tragedy. In my opinion, the most beautiful lines of the poem, indeed those that are famously recreated in paintings later in the 19th century, such as the one on the slide here by John William Waterhouse, are charming in their vivid imagery of the knight and the maiden, and of course, detail a medieval, fragrant setting. But the sentiment that bookends the poem, if you like, is the silence, so a withered landscape and a solitary figure. Solitary in the sense of being described as alone and also clearly feeling isolated from the world as we might expect to know it around us. And other romantic writers were deeply infatuated with a central figure who was either passive or isolated and presented this idea in their poetry as well. So Keats's poem presents uh, and creates a friction of emotions within us as we are invited in a short poem, let's remember it is uh, less than 300 words, this work, to experience a variety of sensations. It moves from intrigue, oh, what can ail thee, to passion, building to those kisses for in the poem, to a fearful enchantment when we see those pale kings and warriors, to what could be read, as a resigned lament, so that repetitive conclusion of and no birds sing. As uh, Kelvin Everest has actually written, the, the poem could be said to be a haunted expression of Keats's response to his brother's death, his tortured love for Fanny, and his sense of being dangerously enthralled to his poetic muse. It's that final point about the poetic muse that I want to focus on. Um, here we can find a resemblance to other poets of the time who also wrestle with this idea of a artistic calling. It's what Kelvin Everest has called, quote, the brooding and anxious incertitude of this poem. Here is a speaker not comforted by a poetic duty, but rather feeling anxiety ridden 
in a nerve wracking state of insecurity about where exactly that poetic duty might lead. It might not surprise you to know that this lone figure reappears in the work of the Romantics. Um, and in focusing both on the knight's passivity and the dirge-like tone of La Belle Dame Sans Merci, as well as some key images, I will take you through just, just some examples. Percy Bysshe Shelley, born just three years before Keats in 1792, presents a wandering figure in one of his earlier poems, Alastor. This is a work composed in 1815, published in 1816. Shelley writes of a poet figure that leaves his cold fireside and alienated home to seek strange truths in undiscovered lands. The combination of a projected figure presented by Shelley to try to understand the role of the poet in his meditation is combined with autobiographical inflections here. This arrangement returns in Shelley's poetic corpus and other works are companions to Keats's La Belle in their depiction of this effect. And that includes Shelley's 1821 work, Epipsychidion, which I'm going to talk about briefly now. And this work is a meditation on love, leading to intense self-reflection and eventually an imaginary escape into paradise. Shelley writes in the central section of Epipsychidion, quote, Twin spheres of light who rule this passive earth, this world of love, this me. The poet speaker is at the centre of the universe and things revolve around him. As with the knight who is enthralled to the maiden, here Shelley arguably depicts a version of himself twisted and turned by external influences. These Shelley poems that I'm giving as an example here are actually long works, so they do present a different kind of reading experience to Keats's La Belle. But if we turn now to the pale figures at the end of Keats's poem, um, and you might notice the word pale is repeated three times in the tenth stanza of Keats's work. The pale figures are frightening and prophetic because their paleness indicates they are removed from the world. In Shelley's poem, the pale figure is female uh, and addressed as the moon. And it is her pale and waning lips that signal the movement of the poem's central figure into a bleak and, it is implied, lifeless existence. These are words of cool comfort echoing through the poem, such as illumining a silver voice that gives life and death, death and life. And they show how Shelley also presents a concern about how a poetic vocation can lead to a state of contradictory and therefore inconclusive emotions. Here is perhaps the struggle rather than the joy in what Keats might have called negative capability, perhaps. The poet, it is implied, has this duty to embrace and engage with difficult emotions. In Shelley, eventually the poet emerges thus, and these are the lines on the slide. At length into the obscure forest came the vision I had sought through grief and shame. Shelley's poet enters a wintry wilderness, comparable in some ways to Keats's cold hillside. But if you read Shelley's poem in full, which I of course recommend you do, you will notice it has a very different ending. Contrary to the moon figure, the pale figure, there is another female figure called Emily, who is redemptive for Percy Shelley's speaker. It strikes me that Shelley and Keats develop a kind of romantic uncertainty in these writings. Shelley is at this point in his career more able to present something semi-autobiographical. And in that same year, he even ascribes this onto Keats himself when Shelley writes the work Adonais, an elegy on the death of John Keats. Percy Shelley's longer narrative poems reveal a similar preoccupation with the poetic fate amongst an imagined landscape. Both are wrestling with the potential for hope but they must also grapple with the potential for failure. So when rereading Keats's La Belle dans Son Merci this time, I was also reminded of some lesser known poetical works by Mary Shelley. Um, so after her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, drowned off the coast of Italy in 1822, Mary Shelley began to write more verse. Percy Shelley died aged 29 and Mary Shelley was left a widow at just 24 years old. Some of her writings after this date are tinged with a fascination with mortality and a genuine mourning relating to the feeling of losing close ones 
just as perhaps Keats's writings were by 1819 onwards, especially uh, related to um, his thoughts about losing loved ones to death and, of course, his agony um, with regards to Fanny Braun and the torturous disappointment of breaking off their love affair. Mary Shelley's poem, A Dirge, was published in The Keepsake for 1831 and was written to be set to music. The poem is explicitly recalling Percy Shelley's tragic death and lamenting her own loss. And the sorrow, as can be read in poems like this, written around this time, often corresponds to the outpouring of emotion we also see in her journal. As Judith Pascoe has written in Mary Shelley in her Times, Percy Shelley's death haunts this poem, A Dirge. The poem begins with Mary Shelley recalling Percy's tragic death at sea and a dirge is chanted by sea nymphs. The combination of a supernatural or mystical element with the opportunity to almost see into the afterlife in the deeply aestheticised sorrow, um, Mary writes, sea nymphs forevermore love shall shadily chant their dirge, can be read alongside Keats's lonely night, I think. Both poems build to a crescendo of loneliness and sorrow. So Mary Shelley ends the poem as you have on the slide. O oh, list, O oh, list, O oh, list, the spirits of the deep. Loud sounds their wail of sorrow while I forever weep. In another poem, simply referred to as Stanzas, published in 1839, that begins, O oh, come to me in dreams, my love, Mary Shelley writes in a similar tone, and here again we find ancient fables, quote, that is, a quote, a sacred spell and hopes betrayed, as some of the, the words she uses in the poem. Perhaps the most appropriate comparison, though, is the line used to close the first and the final stanzas, press mine eyelids with thy kiss. Here's the final stanza in full, as listed on the slide. Then come to me in dreams, my love, I will not ask a dearer bliss. Come with the starry beams, my love, and press mine eyelids with thy kiss. In Keats's poem, the knight shuts his lady's wild, wild eyes with kisses for. This poignant gesture is almost a ritual and it's highly emotive. The poems are also similar in form as you could hear how both of them would be set to music, could be set to music. I realise I've deviated a bit from wandering figures here, um, but they can be found in Mary Shelley's fiction, as many of you will know. The protagonists of her two most famous novels, Frankenstein and The Last Man, are isolated and arguably often passive, a bit like Keats's knight. And it is in part our fascination with this vulnerable quality that keeps up the momentum in those famous works. And in Mary Shelley's less famous novel, Valperga, which is definitely my favourite of her works after Frankenstein, the protagonist there, Castruccio, has a relationship with a prophetess. This leads us to Byron, and his most famous poem, perhaps, uh, which, although completely different from Keats's in tone, is completely different from Keats's in tone, also shows a passive young male swayed and influenced by the women in his life. This is Don Juan, and I'm going to talk about this briefly on the next slide. So, Lord Byron. Um, Byron, who was, of course, a friend of the Shelleys, um, also wrote poems that were in many ways bleak and showed little or no hope. You can see, for example, his 1816 apocalyptic work, Darkness, which begins, I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished. But with regards to uh, a wandering protagonist in the thrall of a woman, it is his most famous work, Byron's epic satire, Don Juan, which presents a passive male lover. Don Juan is a famous character who is featured in other artistic works, um, traditionally as the figure of Don Juan, who is hedonistic, arrogant and a libertine, seducing women and living a corrupt life. But in Byron's version, you will notice that Juan is inexperienced and very passive, and Byron's hero is the one that is seduced, rather than being the seducer. So the image on the slide here is a painting of a scene from Canto 2 of Don Juan by Ford Maddox Brown. Our hero has survived an awful shipwreck after being sent away from his hometown following a scandal, and you can read more in the poem itself. But let's just say that Canto 1 has shown Don Juan's fall from sexual innocence, and here another woman enters the narrative to shape his story. 
And this is all relevant because we might connect this to the passive role the knight plays in Keats's tale. I think the comparison is particularly interesting because the Byronic satire and comic scenes of Don Juan make Byron's poem appear to be so many worlds apart, perhaps, from Keats's melancholy verses. But the fate of Juan and his trials and tribulations reveal a pessimism and a comparable disdain for a particular kind of human existence. Um, and this is also something that the narrator of Don Juan comments upon. The narrator of Don Juan of Byron's poem is an even bigger character than Juan himself. The poem contains famous laments from the narrator, who is a version of Byron. So we've got that kind of semi-autobiographical element again. And for example, and the narrator laments his ageing and um, uh, gives a clear meditation on mortality in the following lines. But now at 30 years, my hair is grey. I wonder what it will be like at 40. I thought of a peruke the other day. My heart is not much greener and in short, I have squandered my whole summer while twas May. This epic work, providing 17 cantos, is the longest poem I have discussed today. Um, to read it, you will, I think, choose to begin at the beginning, as Byron himself writes. So there are plenty of other romantic writers we could read alongside Keats's La Belle. There's two more that I'll mention briefly are Felicia Hemans and John Clare. In the case of Hemans, her writing depicts a traditional Welsh, Welsh history, and she engages with the past in that way, and that might link to Keats's poem. In Hemans's work, poetic inspiration is returned through connecting to the history of the Welsh bards. For example, in her poem, The Rock of Cader Idris, she discusses the dread gloom of grandeur. And in The Meeting of the Bards, another poem, she places the assembly of ancient figures, crucially not in kingly hall or bower, but while, where wild nature Gert herself power. So um, I think Hemans might be relevant here because here an ancient tradition is recast and reopened for a contemporary audience by the poet. And although there is a suggestion of poetic insight or revelation, there's also this kind of constant sense of loss permeating her work. Um, uh, a sense of loss um, of what has passed. There's also John Clare, who was a working class poet whose verses often depict a contradictory and perhaps enchanting landscape, alongside his introspective reflections on his mental state and also this links, of course, to the mental illness that John Clare had. Um, as in Keats's La Belle, the combination of a poetic calling and a beguiling landscape, and then ultimately, again, this sense of loss is very present, I think. So uh, just because that's returned me to this idea of um, a beguiling landscape, um, that's brought me back round to what I'd like to close with, which is my favourite part of Keats's La Belle dans son merci, set amongst that beautiful scenery before desolation approaches. She found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange, she said, I love thee true. So on the slide here, I've just put the organisations that I'm affiliated with and who I'd like to thank very much for supporting my work. Cardiff University, Keats House, the British Association for Romantic Studies and the Keats Shelley Association of America. I encourage you to seek out further online resources about romanticism through them. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my reflections today and thank you for listening. <laughs>